name is uh, Kari Lehmann. I come from the Norwegian Data Protection Authority. And that's actually the first agenda point, Norway. <laughs> because there was a typo in the uh, printed uh, program where it said Denmark. So that's, uh, it's Norway, just uh, to, to rest that case. Sweden won the Euro, uh, Eurovision Song Contest this year. And Finland won the chair of the EDPB. So at least Norway, we, we need this panel, at least. <laughs> Let us have it. Yes, uh, and you uh, might wonder why uh, the Data Protection Authority put uh, this topic uh, on the CPD agenda, when privacy becomes political. You actually just asked me that. Uh, and I hope to answer that. I'll give a short introduction to the topic. But first, I want to introduce uh, this brilliant panel. Um, I think maybe it might be the best panel of CPDP this year. I don't know, we'll find out soon. Uh, but first, to my very left at the end, it's uh, Frederik Borgesius. He's a scholar and professor from uh, Radborg University in the Netherlands. And he just won a prize just minutes before entering this panel. So maybe, Frederik, you can just tell what, the, what is this prize that you won? Yeah, it was clearly a team paper. It was the best, best privacy paper of last year, according to the CNIL, the French Data Protection Authority. I feel a bit um, embarrassed being the only one here because it was a team paper, me as a lawyer working with three computer scientists. And in summary, they found out and tested it in a large scale that on many websites, if you enter, for instance, your email address or even your password, before you click enter, not only the website already takes it, but it leaks already to third parties. And um, uh, in a complicated scheme, they also check then by making a separate email address for each visited website. And, there is, uh, and then checking where the spam came in, then you can also see which websites uh, leak it, etc. And then I had the easy job of explaining <laughs> how that breaches the GDPR. Right. So actually my co-authors uh, deserve much more credit uh, than me. Well, congratulations on your Thank prize. You. And then we have Anna Fielder. She is the president of EDRI, uh, European Digital Rights. She's a long-term consumer and privacy advocate. Uh, and Anna, you come from Romania originally, but you live in the UK now. And then we also have a member of the European Parliament, uh, Patrick Breyer. Uh, you represent the European, I was about to say privacy party, but it's the Pirate Party. Um, you come from Germany. Uh, you're a po politician, but also a digital rights activist, I believe. Um, and you're part of the Liebe Committee, and you have extensive experience with uh, digital policy work. Yes. Okay. Um, I have two slides to introduce this topic. Um, I'll keep it short. And then uh, we will have a discussion in the panel. I didn't ask the panelists to prepare an introduction, so we want to keep it light and dialogue-based. We also encourage uh, questions or comments, short comments from the audience. And I, I can also take them throughout and also at the end, if you'd like, you can uh, give me a sign and I'll, I'll try to fit you in if you want to participate. I'll also try to keep the panel about an hour so that you have a little bit of space before the next session starts at a quarter past five. So uh, about two years ago, uh, the Norwegian government established a privacy uh, commission uh, consisting of experts from different fields. Uh, we were not part of it, which I think is a good thing. And in the fall, they um, presented their report. And the mandate they had was uh, to give, um, take the temperature, what is going on, on with privacy in Norwegian society and what needs to be done to um, fix it if there's a problem. So the key, uh, to sum up the, the very kind of highlights of this report is that uh, they concluded that digitalization has happened at the expense of privacy. And they uh, came with 140 concrete recommendations and they looked uh, specifically at public sector, the justice sector, education and also kind of consumer um, 
uh, sector as well. Uh, and in each of these sectors, they had specific recommendations, but um, the may be main overall uh, recommendation that they had is that they uh, recommend that the government establish a, a national privacy uh, policy across, across all sectors. So this is, uh, we found this very interesting at the authority. What does it actually mean in practice? Uh, what could such a kind of political uh, policy look like? And why haven't we had one already? Yes. Um, so back to the question, why do we want to put it on the agenda for the CPDP? Uh, today is the fifth uh, anniversary for the GDPR. Uh, and based on the cases we have in Norway and also the dialogue with the businesses in Norway, our impression is that a lot of good work has been done, but there is still a lot to do. And in order to make this work, we not only need a regulation and enforcement of it, but we need all layers of society to contribute. Uh, individuals, companies, governments and politicians. Um, so that's what we want to find out. How can we do this in practice? Uh, we are independent and we have no political affiliations. Uh, and we also really want to put uh, the privacy. We need more voices in the privacy debates in Norway. Privacy is often mentioned in uh, celebratory speeches by politicians, but seldom we hear about it when we have elections. Um, and it's also the same for some companies, um, not all, but often it's mentioned uh, as you know uh, something uh, nice to have, but not always is it kind of saturated throughout the organization. And in Norway, I'm very happy to have Edri here as an NGO that engages uh, with privacy. But in Norway, we don't really have a lot of organizations that uh, kind of engages in the privacy debate. We have more and more uh, Amnesty, uh, Consumer Council, Norwegian Board of Technology, and so on engages. But we would like more voices, not only politicians, also NGO, and also the media. When this uh, report was launched, and you have them about every 10 years, and it's like an opportunity to kind of lift the view and look at the whole picture, it was uh, hardly covered by the media at all. It was covered by specialist media, like uh, digitalization, uh, publications, and so on. But it didn't really spark a big public debate, uh, which I think is unfortunate. And that is what we want to achieve um, in Norway, but also here, uh, to spark debate, hear more vo voices, also get inspiration from other countries and other perspectives. How can we solve this? How can we find practical solution to achieve privacy in society? And then on my last slide, I just want to throw some issues uh, out there um, that I think most of these issues were covered by the report that I just mentioned. And I think these are issues that will be relevant in debate around privacy in the years um, that will come. Uh, and the first one is, um, I think, a very good point from that report was that for individuals, it's kind of impossible to take care of your own privacy when you have to deal with the tech giants. Uh, privacy uh, notices are too long and how can you um, actually you know um, engage with your rights in this kind of environment I also think that the collection uh, and it's been a lot of focus on the individual rights and I think the collective dimension of data protection and privacy will be more prevalent in the years ahead we have one example from Netherlands uh, Frederick that I hope maybe you can can comment on, and that was the child benefit scandal where, where algorithms mm -hmm. um, made a mistake and also a discriminatory uh, mistake that had big ramification in, in Dutch society and also had political ramification. Um, so that's an example of the maybe collective dimension that we will see more of in the years to come. I also think that we uh, will even more see, need to see privacy as part of a whole. Um, as data kind of saturates all parts of society, consumer, environment, economy, privacy and the use of data is part of all of it. And we need to kind of get a grip on that. 
Uh, and then the second last point is the tragedy of the commons. Um, in Norway, um, an example of this is when you um, were fishing for herring and you didn't have any regulations on it, and then you overfished and the herring was gone. And I think it's a little bit the same um, situation now with AI coming in. We don't quite understand the consequences of AI and digitalization of society. We don't quite understand the opportunities and neither the consequences. And therefore, it's hard to regulate because we don't quite know what the problem in is, so how do we kind of solve it? And that's also uh, kind of points to the last uh, point on the slide, how to, to regulate this. Um, and one point that we will get back to in the debate as well is uh, the EU is very active in this uh, digital area. A lot of regulation, a lot of strategies, and also when it comes to privacy and AI. Uh, but what about the national perspective? Uh, the perception from Norway, a little bit the impression I get from politicians is that it's all coming from the EU anyway, so why should we do anything? I'm curious to know if other countries are the same or if, if Norway is unique there. Yeah, and the last point is, is basically that uh, we can't have regulation alone. We need a lot of different measures to have data protection and privacy uh, in the whole of societies. We need regulation, we need politicians to engage, we need guidance and help the, the businesses, we need sector initiatives, and we need to create a culture for privacy. <coughs> Uh, not only in companies, but also, I think, in society and for politicians and in, in government um, as well. Okay, so that was a lot of, uh, <laughs> of points. Um, but now I want to go uh, to the panel. And the first question I, I wanted to ask is, do people care about privacy? And what do you think they expect from their politicians in this area? But before I... I we go into that question. I wanted to ask if you had some immediate thoughts about the kind of landscape that I um, I described in Norway about uh, digitalization happening at the expense of privacy. Is it is it uh, unique to Norway, or, or can you recognize some of it? And also about the political debate that you, you have it in some areas, but as a like holistic, it's it's lacking at the national level in Norway. Do you have some immediate thoughts on this? Okay, so who do you want to start? Frederick, do you want to start? Um, well, I don't have a good image of uh, what happens in Norway in public debate, but I was quite impressed by the fact that such a report was drawn up and that, uh, um, um, as I understand it, the government hired or uh, at least asked um, large number of experts and I spoke to to them once so um, I saw how diverse they were and apparently they they um, were given enough time which is also very good so that was one aspect of the uh, debate in Norway that I was very impressed by and um, well later on I can tell more about uh, the Netherlands if you would like but one thing that helps us in the Netherlands is that we are blessed since at least a decade with incredibly good tech journalist. We are, we are a small country, but uh, each major newspaper has now a good, uh, at least one good tech journalist. And uh, like in many countries, uh, we also have all these um, uh, separate um, tech websites, but also mainstream newspapers now um, uh, have good tech journalists. And we're really blessed with that because that uh, helps public debate a lot. Mm. So in, in uh, the Netherlands, you actually do have public debate on this, on kind of a higher level privacy issues? or Yeah, well, sadly, we also have enough scandals, so that triggers public debate, okay, of yes. course. Um, 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 but do you think that's a factor, that scandals have actually put this on the political agenda and the media ag agenda? I... Cannot re I'm really happy and thankful that we have such good tech journalists um, and some uh, colleagues, uh, for instance, from Belgium uh, um, uh, uh, tell me other, oh, they're somewhat envious of that. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I don't know whether the, it is coincidence or um, any 
causal effect and which in which direction, I do not know. Well, on the other hand, the child benefit scandal was um, uh, largely brought to the attention of of the public uh, by two investigative journalists who invested loads of time. Right. Okay. Anna. So, <coughs> sorry, can you hear me, everybody? Because it's got this huge noise at the back, which doesn't make it easy. Um, so, do you want me to answer about the general situation, or shall I? Uh, but by the way, congratulations to a brilliant study. Uh, it's really good, and it's it's a, and I think a lot of sectoral issues that you mentioned in that study apply to a lot of countries. Mm. Um, but just to give you a background, obviously I live in the UK. I'm the chair of the Board of European Digital Rights. Um, and I'm also Romanian by birth. Uh, we've got a lot of national members, so I thought, well, we're such a lovely, rich resource, I'll do some crowdfunding. So I sent a message to all our members and I said, please, can you give me some concrete examples about your country? Does politics and economics trumps privacy in your country? Mm -hmm. And I got quite a few really good examples. Um, so maybe I can I can start answering your first question about do people care or would you like me to go to the maybe the examples would be uh, interesting to hear like how uh, yeah. do people care yeah uh, no uh, you said you you, you asked uh, whether it was part of the political debate in the different countries or in Romania well Yes, I mean, if you look at the UK, I mean, we are a basket case, basically, because we've exited the European Union and, uh, you know, we have a government that is busily dismantling all the acquired rights over so many years. Um, and it's, um, and it, and it's uh, you know, if you talk about the Data Protection Act, there's a big debate now because the... The, it's going through Parliament to actually diminish the rights in the Act in order to facilitate trade, essentially. Mm. Trade agreements with all the Asian countries and all the big blocks that do not have necessarily GDPR-style protections. Yeah. So the purpose behind this is to facilitate trades and economics, but at the same time there is rhetoric about oh, human rights and privacy rights, so, so the two do not join up. Mm. And we have other laws going through the, uh, you know, lessen human rights overall. Mm. But at the same time, we have a very vibrant civil society. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, uh, you know, a very big media, and some of them are brilliant and some of them are populist. Um, and unfortunately, probably the majority of the population reads mostly the populist media and also influenced by social media. But we do have a lot of debate in the media and on television as well. So there is a balance there. But I would say overall, if you look at different sectors, what happens in schools, for example, um, I mean, my daughter is a teacher and I have six grandchildren and I'm absolutely astounded that they all, during the pandemic as well, use Google Classroom yeah. as, a, as a, you know, teaching facility. And they say it's not good enough. They complain all the time about it, but <coughs> obviously... And, oh, and Teams is the other one and it's the same throughout Europe, actually. Whereas... You know, if you had better policies on government procurement, uh, there are better alternatives out there that are open source that could be used in schools. So this is clearly something that national governments and local authorities can do, but they don't. Mm. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll stop now yeah. and maybe give you more examples later. I mean, I'll bring Romania yeah, in I'm a bit later. Yeah, I'm curious to hear about the situation in Romania as well. We can save that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how about you, Patrick? What's your impression uh, about the discussions in, in Germany around this uh, contra the EU level? Yes, well, uh, first of all, digitization, um, as you mentioned, of course, has made it possible to 
build up a, a surveillance state to a degree that has never been imaginable in the past, that's for sure. But you know, the debate is, is split between those that think uh, digitization is uh, um, a thing of the devil and we want nothing to do with it. And those who say, um, oh, there's all these great opportunities. We need to be a world leader when it comes to digitization, to AI. We need to use all the potentials to everything possible. And these are two extremes that um, uh, we can find in the debate, but uh, neither of them is, is very helpful and differentiated. I have most insights into EU politics these days and I think you can tell uh, how much on the top of the agenda it is by, for example, the fact that there is a specific committee that has been set up, the um, Pegasus Committee to look into abuses of these um, technologies, um, but also by the fact that this week, for instance, uh, we've had the Irish Data Protection Commissioner and questioned her about um, TikTok and uh, why is it taking years for any enforcement action and why is it so piecemeal uh, what they are doing and, and we've been uh, putting pressure on, on Ireland for, for years to make sure that privacy is being enforced in the digital era as well and so it is very much uh, on the uh, political agenda I think and um, but those who really understand uh, the opportunities and risks of digitization, uh, I'm afraid are rather few mm. in politics. Yes. What about the German political ag agenda? Is this also a hot topic there? In Germany, we have the burden, but also um, the opportunity of our historical responsibility. Mm. And so um, citizens are quite aware um, uh, that um, knowing everything has the potential of controlling everything and having power over everybody um, an authoritarian potential and so i think that um, my fellow uh, um, compatriots um, are privacy sensitive and it is a, a, a large there's a great debate um, in public for instance on proposals such as chat control to screen all communications indiscriminately a very active debate in Germany as well as in some other countries and um, it is it is on the agenda uh, but the way it is implemented by the government often differs markedly from um, what was promised at the outset mm. okay so my next, next question is about uh, people do people care about privacy is, do they understand privacy. I, I think sometimes it feels like uh, climate change and privacy can be similar topics because it's a little bit far away from us and, and it's a little bit distant. And uh, is that why politicians don't have it on their election program? And uh, what is it? Uh, does, do we need uh, people's engagement to engage the politicians or is it the other way? Like, how, how does this work? Uh, Anna, do you have any thoughts? Yes, uh, with pleasure. Yeah. Um, so this is a very good and interesting question and it's always asked and um, I'll start by saying it's quite, it's, it's very difficult to answer and I'll explain why. Um, the brief answer is yes, people do care, but it's much more complex than that. And I'll give you a, a few examples. I mean, generally, it used to be in Europe that the Eurobarometer before the GDPR used to do these huge uh, surveys along all the countries of Europe, and I don't think they do them now. Um, so, you know, I can give you a few examples. Uh, when I asked this question of my colleagues, the first answer I got was from our member, the European Sex Workers Alliance, who did an in-depth research of their members throughout Europe, because, you know, what you get usually with sex workers, apparently they don't care about privacy because they put their pictures and phone numbers online. And what they discovered is that the situation is much more, they, they did focus groups and surveys, and what they discovered is that is far more complex than that. Yes, they do that because they have to earn a living, 
but actually they do care about their privacy very much outside that earning a living, and the two are conflated. So the label is these people don't care about privacy. Um, ICO, the Information Commissioner in UK, does really extensive surveys of people's attitudes. Um, also about data sharing, attitudes, you know, broken down by age. And, and what those statistics shows that o overall you have to look at different factors, age, community, if you are a vulnerable group or not, uh, knowledge of human rights and data protection, uh, and also trust in different companies. Uh, if, if the questions is asked about sharing data. And, and so what you find is that young people that are more confident and more knowledgeable about what's happening online, they, they are more aware and they care about privacy, but also they're more ready to share information because they think, oh, I can control it. Whereas older people are more suspicious and also there's generally lack of knowledge of what's happening under the bonnet. I mean, there's simple visible things like ID theft, but not actually this extensive profiling and targeting um, and so on. Um, so, so basically, I think overall the answer to your question is Yes, they do care, but it depends on context, whom you trust, uh, how much you know about your rights, and so on. And I want to give you one more interesting example that our Danish member sent us. They, um, the, there was a survey of attitudes of Danes regarding government's events, and they tested CCTV cameras and email exchanges and internet. And what they astonishingly found that 80% of Danes don't mind being surveyed by CCTV cameras. You probably know that research. Uh, but with emails and internet, they didn't like it. They mm. wanted those to be private. So yeah. th these are just some examples which yes. show how complex the situation is. It's a nuanced picture. Yeah, yeah. very nuanced it's picture. It's not that you're interested or not. It's uh, yeah. more, yeah. yeah. How about you, Patrick, as a politician, and what is your impression? Are people, do they care about their privacy? I think they definitely do, and indeed uh, polls uh, um, prove it, that uh, people care very much about their privacy, and they understand quite well that knowledge is power and that only uh, a data that is not stored is really safe. They understand the risks and uh, also what, what happens on the internet. But the problem is they often feel powerless. They often feel there's not, nothing they can do. And uh, then, of course, there are more pressing, is pressing mm. issues of, of uh, everyday uh, uh, worries. And um, still, that's what they have the, the politicians for, to do the boring work. And they, I think they want to, their representatives to fight. Uh, for their privacy and to stand up to, to the advocates of, um, of a surveillance state or of um, the data greedy industry. Mm. But unfortunately in practice it is those that prevail oftentimes um, because public pressure is missing and the uh, public doesn't uh, take so much notice or um, as I said other issues are, are more pressing. So usually you win when there is a lot of public attention and pressure and sometimes women. <laughs> Frederick, do you have any reflections on this question? Um, yeah, I agree based on survey results for, um, for decades now that they show that people really care about privacy. And some, especially some economists, that tend to explain that, that tend to answer, well, yeah, people say that, but if you look at their behavior, like they, they use social media and they use a certain, certain search engines, um, and that is much more important. Their behavior is much more important than what people are saying. So, uh, there, so we doubt whether people actually care. But um, I don't believe in that counter argument at all. But um, um, uh, for instance, um, I and possibly, uh, no, uh, presumably many people, we care about um, child labor, etc. But if you have a hungry kid at home and you're, you run after a full working day to the supermarket, 
and, and quickly uh, grab some food to try to uh, cook something healthy at home. There's no time to study uh, labels and to start um, looking up on the internet what is the background of every product. And I would think it would be completely unreasonable to look at such a situation and then conclude, ah, apparently this person doesn't care about the environment and doesn't care about child labor because the person in, uh, in his or her consumer behavior doesn't show that. It's, it just means that uh, um, everybody has such a busy life that um, um, I, th I think it is um, also, it should not be a, uh, um, we, it should not be the responsibility by people's individual choices to mm. arrange um, what they care about. The, yeah. That is, it goes for child labor, for the environment, and for um, uh, privacy. It, sh it should be um, uh, policy makers that help to protect people. Mm. Uh, we have also done surveys among Norwegian people, and we do see that people do take action. Even though you're on Facebook, you m might do other things to protect yourself. You might not post as much information on Facebook, for example, or you might abstain from uh, posting a comment in a debate online, or you might uh, not do an internet search because you don't quite know who might be looking over your shoulder. So we do see that people actually take actions, even though they don't log completely off, they do protect themselves in, in ways. So I think that's, that's also really interesting. But in the Netherlands, is privacy a topic that you would find on the political agenda of political parties? Well, after the infamous child benefit scandal, should I summarize it for? Um, yeah, yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah. So, it's a huge story and a huge scandal, so it's going to be hard. I'm going to try to summarize it in reasonably Short. Uh, brief time. <laughs> yeah. um, still, I start at the start. Um, like a decade ago, there was um, a journalistic reporting on indeed quite shocking um, um, uh, welfare fraud, and it was called in uh, some more popular um, media. Well, it was from some Eastern European country. They found out if you bring people to the Netherlands, then they can apply for basically welfare payments um, 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 by going in person to the right office, um, show their passport, etc., And then they, they, um, they applied for some type of welfare payments. They got that every month. But in the end, it was a kind of uh, a small mafia um, gang behind it. The people that signed up never got it. And the m mafia gang took the welfare payments. Uh, that huge reporting. And it was uh, scandalous. But um, um, percentage-wise, it was trivial, of course, compared to the billions of euros that we bump around in, in a, like in a proper welfare state. But it got huge attention. That influenced um, um, uh, public opinion, which influenced votes. And that led, in the end, to um, um, more repressive um, uh, statutes being proposed, like we should be really strict on welfare fraud. Um, Parliament adopted it, the, the Senate, which is supposed to take a step back in the Netherlands and think through legal problems. Um, oh, and the Parliament adopted it uh, even by doing a specific vote on it. So it. Not even they didn't amend the statute, but they thought, oh, this is one of those some simple files that we don't have to go through an actual vote. It passed through the Senate. And then, for some strange reasons, in the Netherlands, it is the tax office who gives out such benefits. But the tax office has more of a culture of taking money rather than giving out benefits. So that was probably also part of the problem. So they had an incredibly strict statute, which then they applied yeah, largely according to the letter of the law. And um, so, so far we have seen so uh, mistakes by journalists, basically, um, by voters, by the government, by uh, the two chambers of parliament, um, by the tax office, who um, you could complain they, they, sh they should have applied the law more lenient, but I have to be fair, they applied the law. And then every now and then uh, somebody um, um, went to court, but that was, of course, a very small fraction of the people because you need energy and money and you, you need to be... Um, and even if you don't have money, you have to have time to read through all the difficult... F um, 
information and f know where you can find cheap or free um, um, legal help, etc. Some people went to court, but different courts only saw one example, and they, they basically thought, this looks pretty harsh, but yeah, this is what the statute says. So, um, so even judges didn't have an overview of um, how bad the situation was in general. Oh, and I forgot to say the results. The results were um, uh, that if you made a mistake in the files, and it's very easy to make a mistake in filling in uh, Dutch government files, then um, it was above a rather low threshold, I think a couple of hundred euros or a thousand euros, it was assumed to be fraudulent. And then if, you, if it turned out that you had um, received too much money, because it was assumed fraudulent, you always have to pay it back, of course, that makes sense. But if fraud was assumed, you cannot pay it back in monthly installments, but you had to cough it up immediately. But yeah, these were people that needed welfare payments, like, like single mothers with kids, etc. And they, they can't pay back out of nothing a few thousand euros. Um, so a huge problem, and we can't point to anybody who is um, solely responsible. Everything failed, all the checks and balances, and the voting behavior, I have to be fair, voters failed too, journalists, um, uh, everybody failed here. Um, in the end, the harsh rules were put in an algorithm, but it is actually almost Irrelevant, uh, because um, uh, if the same decisions were made by hand, um, and the algorithm was just a very simple file. So it, it, yeah. it is not an example of AI going wild. It is an example of a modern state over a, a period of decades actually failing in all their thinking about taking care of um, people that have a bit less luck in society. Mm. Super problematic. Oh, and it did have some political results, namely the government fell for it, um, fell because of it. I would say that that's some... A bit of nuance results. though, um, we knew that elections were coming on, yeah. up, so um, it, it, it was needed that they stepped down, mm. but it was not as dramatic um, a gesture mm. that, um, mm, as you, it was slightly less dramatic the, ge the gesture of stepping down as a government than you may think, because elections were coming up anyways, and largely the same parties won again. Yeah, and I also think this uh, had dire effects on marginalized communities that were put, had to pay money back. Some people lost their ch children. I think there was some suicide and there was lots of ramification. And that's also why I think it became a, a big scandal, because you could actually see the effect it had on actual people as well. Very good point. So it, yeah. it clearly harmed the poorer people who are less lucky in society, yeah. um, which sadly largely correlates with uh, non-white people mm. in the Netherlands. Mm. On top of that, there was also some um, direct discrimination uh, going on where, um, um, where sometimes it was coded that people had, for instance, a mm. double nationality um, um, in Tax office files. Yeah, so the Netherlands, I think, is one of the first countries in Europe that has a dedicated uh, algorithm authority or regulator. Do you think that's an effect of that? Mm, it is definitely um, an uh, effect largely caused by, the, by this uh, benefit scandal. But again, it wasn't really an AI or algorithm problem. It was oh. a structural but I think democ that was it, well, democracy it was failing. It was perceived yes. also as an algorithm yes. problem. Yeah. And, um, the algorithm regulator is it's more of an um, advice body on how other regulators should cooperate mm. regarding mm. questions mm. about algorithms, mm. etc. It's, it's useful, but it's not that we have a, now a separate algorithm authority. Yeah. So what, what's the takeaway here? Uh, is it that a scandal is needed to put privacy on the political agenda? Or, well, I or hope what, not. Is, uh, what is needed? Patrick, do you have any thoughts about this? Well, I think what it takes is um, many people engaging and uh, reaching out to their politicians, showing them that it's important, following them around, pestering them, calling their offices. So um, basically, the starting point is always a public debate. And we can see that with many privacy files, the problem is just that there is silence. Nobody talks about them. There is no public perception about them. Uh, and what works sometimes, and I use the example again of, of chat control, because it's a scandal in itself, right? Uh, being proposed, it's, uh, 
scan all private messages. It's like the post office all opening all letters, which is just outrageous. And, you know, the end of, of digital privacy of correspondence. And uh, how we started a debate in some countries, such as uh, Sweden and Spain, was, for example, with an op-ed. And uh, somebody would uh, explain the problem and um, attack those responsible for it. Um, in Sweden, it was Commissioner uh, Johansson. In Spain, it was the uh, EP rapporteur, Sechelejos. And then they would respond. And then you, you've, you've started a, a debate about it. And, and th there is a public debate. And in, in Sweden, it has resulted in protests. It has resulted in uh, even liberal conservatives uh, MPs falling in to the criticism and uh, that can trigger a, a really good thing if, if you manage to to explain why it is a problem and why it matters um, but that's really what what it needs i think the scandals are out there it's just a matter of making people understand and see them mm. and i also think one of the challenges is actually to make people understand why this is uh, important how it affects them so that's uh, challenge as well. Anna, do you have any thoughts? Um, yes, I think, well, there's two issues. Yes, scandals do put this on the public debate, but scandals, you know, for example, you have scandals of teenagers committing suicide because of their what happens to them on social media, and that's happened in Britain more than once, and then there is a public debate and a public storm, but actually no serious political action is taken, but it brings it much more to the consciousness of people. And then there is an economic issue that brings it on the political agenda. For example, if you suddenly have like, you know, we had in Britain the Microsoft decision on competition, um, so you can have an economic thing with a big techie company becoming a monopoly to that, such an extent, uh, accumulating vast amounts of data that you must, you know, do something about it. So that can bring public debate as well. Um, another issue is surveillance in public places. You know, for example, as you know, happened in France. The, the French Parliament for the first time passed this law leading to the Olympics, legalizing uh, facial recognition in public places, something that we have fought against throughout Europe. Mm. And it is uh, biometric data, it is uh, considered sensitive data under European law, and yet you know, despite all the fights in France and pointing out that technologically this is sensitive data, the parliament passed it based on a, you know, on a lot of misinformation. So I think there's a variety of things that they can, but can I just add about Eastern Europe? Yes, because please. we've been talking about, you know, Germany and Netherlands and Norway and the UK all, you know, Western long standing democracy. So, you know, let me give you an exa example from Romania where the de debate is not about what else we can do. The debate is how do we enforce what we have? And when I asked my Romanian colleagues what they think about it, they basically said always politics trumps human rights privacy on a national level here. National governments don't even. Uh, don't do even basics to comply with. So talking about beyond GDPR is science fiction. And they gave me lots of examples, uh, which I can give you examples, but you know, we probably don't have that much time. So I think we have like a divided Europe. You have a lot of countries in the East that are still not implementing the basics. They don't give enough resources to their data protection authorities. Romanian DPA have a third of their vacancies still open. They don't impose fines. They don't take action. They can't even fine public authorities. Um, so, so, you know, we have to be realistic and see what we can do in a united Europe rather than, um, you know, so yeah, that's part of the story. Yeah. That's a, a good perspective. There are different uh, challenges yeah. in different parts. 
Um, in Norway, uh, one of the challenges, I think, uh, for the politicians is that uh, the EU is so active, so it feels almost like they're paralyzed because they're just waiting to see what comes from the EU on AI or privacy regulation. So they're kind of inactive, they don't engage so much in these issues. Uh, is that something that you can recognize, uh, Patrick? Do you see that in other countries as well? You started the introduction by saying that um, this is Norway's answer to the Eurovision Song Contest. And if I could sing, I would have sung just now, but <laughs> I, I'll spare you. Um, so the thing is, you know, we, we have learned um, from GDPR that the only way to impress uh, um, uh, industry and big tech is uh, a, to find a European approach. If you um, regulate at national level, they, they don't care. It's not yeah. possible to enforce really. And so there it really makes sense when it comes to the markets uh, and international uh, players to uh, regulate at European uh, level. However, take for instance um, the security sector. There, there is so much uh, leeway for member states to, to regulate and to use totally different approaches there um, because there's only a very loose uh, framework set um, by the EU. But um, for instance, do you have uh, indiscriminate data retention in place? Or um, do you, do you um, use biometric mass events? Do you use facial recognition? Uh, in, in France, by the way, we managed to keep the, the face surveillance out of the legislation, but what they enacted was uh, behavioral surveillance. So you will be flagged to the police for behaving not like everybody else. So this is like really a, a Chinese style system of making people um, behave conformly. Uh, take, for instance, intelligence services being regulated so differently from one country to the other, or take um, health data. We're currently debating European health data space, and systems are totally different throughout Europe. In some countries, you have this mandatory health file for all citizens at a central level. In other countries, you don't have anything at all. Um, and so there is so much uh, member states can still um, decide beyond um, industry regulation, and I really encourage them to, to set um, good examples and fight for them. Yeah. I mean, Patrick has given some really brilliant examples of what can be done. I mean, I mentioned education previously. Mm -hmm. Education is a really important sec sector where a lot can be done by local authorities and governments, by public procurement, and even educating pupils at the school level, and it's not happening even in the UK. I mean, as I mentioned previously, um, there are examples in Poland, uh, UK, lots of other countries of Google actually sponsoring Chromebooks in schools. Um, you know, so, so this is one sector where national and then facial recognition in public places as Pab uh, Patrick said that US cities that have banned it San Francisco for example but what we have in Europe is just one country making you know making it legal um, and of course uh, it's used extensively by police without any regulatory mm -hmm. actions and yeah. so on I also think the educational example is good uh, because that's also relevant in Norway. The regulation is there, but the the and this has actually been a, a debate in Norway because it's it's quite the situation in schools is quite dire. It's a little bit out of control. The use of technology, the the flow of data, and so on. Uh, so even though there is regulation, there's also obviously a need to take national action and direction and concrete you know tools systems to help the schools deal with it because it's too much for individual municipalities and schools to deal with even though the regulation is there uh, I, I want to uh, open uh, and see if there's any questions or comments from the audience yes please yes thank you uh, could first you please all, say your name? Uh, Elisabeth Stein, the University of Vienna. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this very interesting panel. Um, I would have a question 
regarding, we, we're talking about Generation Z in very many contexts, uh, work life, uh, home office, climate change, and their different approach to a lot of the concepts of the past, traditional concepts, and my um, question would be, uh, if you do have any sustainable data or knowledge, whether the approach of young people, Generation Z, to the concept of privacy is different, given that uh, they are now fully uh, grown up, fully digital. Um, they have been used to being far more surveilled than compared to previous um, generations. My subjective impression is that their approach is, is, is more differentiated uh, than traditionally. And, and my question would therefore be if there are any examples or any studies or any knowledge that you have that would support that impression in the different countries. Thank you. Great question. We'll take one more question and then we'll answer. OK, thank you. Um, my name is Colin Bennett from the University of Victoria in uh, Canada. Um, going back to the title of this panel, Privacy Becomes Political. Um, here's a question. Is privacy a left-wing issue, a right-wing issue, a centrist issue? None of the above or all of the above? Oh, wow. <laughs> Can you repeat the questions because of the noise? Yes, I'll there. repeat the questions. Uh, so the first uh, question was about Generation Z and the perception of privacy, if it's different from previous uh, generations. And there was a uh, uh, hypothesis that uh, it's um, the perception of privacy is more differentiated mm -hmm. than previous generations. Does anyone want to comment on, on that? And also, if there's any studies uh, that we can point to. Um, I can say something about, um, I, uh, so I'm a law professor, so I don't do much survey research myself, but I try to keep track of some of the survey research that others do. And uh, the results are, yeah, you get that with academics, nuanced. So, um, but indeed, um, so for instance, uh, anthropologists who interview and hang out with um, um, uh, teenagers and younger adults, they observe, well, in some ways you could say they seem to be uh, not so dealing so much with privacy because they use social media. On the other hand, um, by the way of messaging and by using, if they talk publicly on social media in codes that their parents don't understand, because that is the, one of the heaviest uh, privacy threats for teenagers. So, um, they, so the general um, conclusion from such surveys and interviews and empirical work is, Yes, youth does care about privacy, but not always in the same way as adults. Mm -hmm. um, apart from that, by the way, um, uh, teenagers, this is also the age where people drive, uh, drink and drive, etc. So even if you would find that they wouldn't care about certain things, then uh, most of us are um, behave more responsible now than I do, definitely, than I did as a teenager, yeah. for instance. And about what? color is uh, what political color goes best with privacy well on quite a few issues it seems to be um, across the political spectrum actually so for instance voices who complain about uh, the, the Netherlands has been has become almost cashless just because um, 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 the our uh, bank system works so practically and everybody um, has um, uh, digital or loads of people uh, use digital payments on their phone it's just um, practical and um, most of the protests that you hear about that because digital paying is clearly l um, interfering more with your privacy than uh, cash most of the protests come more from the more right-leaning side of the political spectrum, while on um, state surveillance, most of the protests tend to come from more the left side of the spectrum. But I don't think you can really say that it is generally a right or left issue, at least in the Netherlands. Do you agree with that, Patrick? <laughs> yes, uh, uh, first of all, I agree with your uh, statement on young people, because indeed, in some polls, they seem less critical than other uh, age groups. But you know, they've grown up with the internet, they're pragmatic. 
Um, but also it's their home and they live with it. They are more exposed to the risks of the internet. And um, we've just recently commissioned a poll on the child control proposal and young people with a large majority are opposed to having their private messages uh, scanned without a reason. For instance, because they do sexting, they post nude images, and uh, which probably not many adults do. Um, so it does show that they are very uh, privacy aware. And when it comes to the political spectrum, I can tell you from the perspective of the European Parliament that generally the left is more uh, uh, privacy aware and uh, engaged when it comes to votes, um, often uh, supported by the center uh, parties, so that there are often center left majorities in my committee, in the Home Affairs Liberal Committee. But um, the center, group renew is also split so for instance um, I think it was last week we voted um, a resolution on US uh, data sharing and adequacy and it was very close very tight only won by 10 or, or 15 votes that um, small majority to criticize the approach to um, put a new privacy shield, new um, scheme for exchanging data uh, to the US in place. Uh, because, for instance, uh, the French uh, liberals uh, often have a different opinion from those from other countries. And when it comes to the right, to the political right, um, the conservatives are probably the least uh, privacy uh, sensitive. The Snowden scandal um, uh, forced them to agree to a GDPR, <laughs> even if the shadow rapporteur Axel Foss was critical at the time. Uh, but actually, if we look further right um, to the national conservatives or even the far right, um, at least part of them um, actually um, supports quite uh, uh, privacy-friendly policies when it comes to our own citizens and rather as opposed to foreigners. So when it's not about immigration but about our own citizens, they are also critical of uh, uh, mass surveillance, um, of um, biometric uh, mass surveillance, for instance. And so sometimes there are interesting, um, interesting coalitions and majorities here. I want to add on this political spectrum thing. Um, I totally agree with you about generation, so I will not add to it, uh, you know, for the sake of time. But, you know, we have a lot of experience of advocating both in the national parliament and, and uh, lobbying, shall we say, yeah. and in the European parliament. I'll mention to you the UK parliament, it, it's quite nuanced. For example, if you if people recall the Cambridge Analytical scandal, our biggest supporter in Parliament and the front, you know, dealing with it was a Conservative, Damien Collins. Mm -hmm. um, very privacy aware, very sort of on the ball with all this. And as part of the Open Rights Group, he was one of the allies. Mm -hmm. Um, on the other hand, when we were advocating on immigration exceptions in the in the Data Protection Act, and there were, you know, we found that both Labour and Conservatives were equally blind to the necessity of having the right clause in the Act. Um, so it is nuanced. It depends on the issue and depends what they see as a politically advantageous election thing rather than you know human rights privacy and unfortunately that can apply to you know both the middle the left and the right mm -hmm. so not an easy answer there um, I think we'll end this panel by a short comment by each of the panelists uh, and the question I have for you is if you look you know a few years ahead um, how is uh, privacy doing on the political agenda? Frederick, do you want to start? Um, yeah, this is one of these topics. It remains important, but it will never be um, um, solved. So we will, it is going to be a continuous um, yeah, fight. Or there will be scandals, sadly. Then there will be wins for privacy. Um, uh, and then a new technology or a new proposal comes up. And um, so, um, yeah, that could make us pessimistic. But um, I think we have to be 
realistic and um, it's just like well this is I'm gonna make the analogy but I realize that will make us depressed but just like with the <laughs> environment it's not that we are gonna solve it at some point but uh, I hope our privacy will do better than on the environment so far okay yeah good Anna well I'm, I'm pretty cynical about politicians respecting human rights now or even in five years' time. Some of them do. But I think what will happen is, depending where technology goes and what an impact artificial intelligence has on things like creativity and creative arts and unemployment and employment, and, and also what effect economics in the particular countries has on the impact of no, on the national industries, monopolies, uh, diversification, and so on. If it goes economically in the wrong way on both sides, they might take more attention. Uh, if it doesn't, they might disregard it as they do now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you will always need fighters for human rights to just keep it on the agenda. Mm -hmm in my view. Yes. Well, on the top of the political agenda, rarely privacy is, I'm afraid. But I think the great power struggles will still be debated a lot in, in five years time. Take, for instance, big tech, uh, how to contain them, surveillance capitalism, how to deal with this. Or take, for instance, the debate we're having around uh, face surveillance and this huge movement in the US, but also in Europe, reclaim your face. So I think when it comes to the societal uh, power struggles, we'll be seeing uh, uh, um, a lot of debate in, in five years as well, I'm sure. Great. I don't know if this panel solved uh, the political uh, dilemma here, but we, you certainly did throw up a lot of interesting perspectives and balls. And I think this is a discussion to be continued. Maybe next CPDP we meet and we are even brighter on this uh, topic. So thank you very much to the panel and to the audience.